I'm Brian Goldfinger from Goldfinger Injury Lawyers. We'd like to wish you and your family a happy holiday season. Don't drink and drive, don't toke and drive, and wait till you get to your destination to reply to that text. Visit goldfingerlaw.com. Hello and welcome to the Raptors Weekly Podcast for the week of November 26th. I'm your host, William Liu. I'm joined on the line by Colin Connors to discuss this non-beef between Kawhi and Greg Popovich. Yeah, it might be the most poli- polite beef of the year, but uh, that's what you expect with San Antonio, so let's get down to it. Yeah, so let's get down to it. First off, I think we have to say, first and foremost, that everybody respects Greg Popovich. He is, in my opinion, the greatest NBA coach in NBA history, but, I mean, of course, you can make cases that I'm willing to listen to for Phil Jackson, you know, for uh, Red Auerbach, you know, people like that. Um, but, you know, Greg Popovich is obviously one of the greatest coaches of all time, and he's a long track record. And he's, to be honest, he seems like a pretty decent guy based on, you know, you never know these people really, but uh, he just seems like a pretty decent guy. So, But anyway, uh, this came up, sort of a non-story really, kind of out of nowhere, but uh, Greg Popovich was asked by a local Spurs reporter um, about how much Patty Mills is stepping up as a leader now that uh, the Spurs have lost some players, and the Spurs did go through a – pretty um, impactful offseason where they lost a lot of veterans like Danny Green, Kawhi Leonard, Mata Ginobili retired, and Tony Parker moved on to the Hornets. And uh, Pop kind of decided to take that question and specifically say that Kawhi, you know, quote, wasn't a leader or anything. Uh, and then he did praise Kawhi for his talent and said he's missed, but he really came back and emphasized that he is not a leader. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, this kind of blew up into a small thing. It was sort of thought of as like, well, maybe Popovich just mints his words. But uh, then Kawhi, you know, after the game, after the Heat game where the Raptors won um, on Sunday, Kawhi took the time to really go into the idea that, like, you know, maybe people are forgotten, but I lead by example. I come in, do my work, and, you know, just generally defending himself, which I think is completely right for him to do because he just kind of caught astray for nothing. I mean, what did you think of all this? Uh, did you think that Popovich was kind of wrong for doing this? And do you think it was maybe intentional? Or do you think it was just blown up into a story because we like sensational things? Uh, we do like sensational things, but I definitely think it was intentional. Like last year, Pop t- subtweeted Kawhi too many times for him to be doing it accidentally at this point. Mm-hmm. But like, I don't know. I like The locker room that Kawhi was in, it was like him, Manu, and uh, him, Manu, Tony, and Tim up until Tim's la- uh, his last year there. He didn't have Tim's. So it's not like there was like this big void he was refusing to fill. Like that locker room is pretty steady for leadership. So I think they kind of just let Kawhi do his thing. So it's not like, and then also like leading by example is kind of like at some point it just kind of you kind of are who you are. Like Kawhi's a lead by example guy. If he's coming in like two hours before practice every day, and like by all accounts he's the hardest worker that like anyone's ever seen. If he's in there like two hours before practice every day, he's leaving two hours afterwards. Like you can't say that's not leadership. And, like, even with the Raptors, Nurse was talking about how he's, like, in training camp, he had some of the young guys, like, probably no harm, honestly, coming in, like, shooting with him early and stuff like that. Like, those are leadership things. Like, just because Pop's a little bit salty doesn't mean that Kawhi's not a leader. Yeah. And, look, I mean, obviously, we're in Toronto, so we hear, you know, more of the day-to-day stuff. But, I mean, there's stories. Like, OG has had uh, quotes where he's talked about how much Kawhi has uh, meant as a leader. You know, Kyle has talked about how Kawhi leads. Obviously, Nick Nurse is there to pump his players as a coach, but, you know, he's talked many times before this incident, basically, about how much Kawhi has led. And, you know, having gone down to a couple practices and stuff, like, the guy who's there, the latest, is Kawhi. Like, there was one practice that maybe, like, um, probably two or three weeks ago now that I was at, probably the last one that I was at. It's been a while. They also went on the road. But, um, yeah, he was there, like, still shooting by himself, like, an hour and a half after everyone else had done their media responsibilities. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you could really question Kawhi's sort of commitment there. I, I just think it's interesting because, yeah, like I agree. Like, you know, a lot of people are going to be able to give Greg Popovich the you know, benefit of the doubt because I think generally speaking people like Pop and they want to defend him and he is shown to be a very thoughtful person overall on different issues. But I think specifically in this case, I mean, he, I think he has reason to be upset with Kawhi. I think the Spurs fan base – freaking hates Kawhi um (laughs) and you know based on the way that he left the franchise like yeah you could see where they're coming from but I mean like you know Popovich himself 2016 this is October before Kawhi had basically an MVP caliber season and led them to the Western Conference Finals before he got hurt 
Um, you know, he went and talked about how, you know, Kawhi's talking in timeouts now. He's joining, he's joking with people more. You could see he demands the ball more, and people know how to play with him in the middle of everything. He's not going to be as vocal as Patty Mills, which, by the way, apparently Patty Mills is just, <laughs> just a very vocal dude. Patty uh, Mills just Rudy Tomjanovich on the floor. Apparently, right? <laughs> a- apparently. Um, but, you know, quote, you know, that's not who he is. He's not Avery Johnson. He does it differently. He's a bit more like Timmy. He's going to lead by example, right? Which is kind of exactly how Kawhi sort of phrased it, which that's why it's strange that Popovich chose to come out and say in definitive terms that Kawhi is not a leader or anything. Because, first off, he's already previously said that Kawhi is a leader and he leads by example. And that's what everyone has said. And so I don't know why it was brought up. I mean, if it, it was just to Trump, like, Patty Mills, like congratulations, everyone knows Patty Mills is a vocal leader now, but I don't know, it's just, it's weird, and also like, I get San Antonio being salty, but maybe focus on your own issues, man, like San Antonio's 9-10 right now the talent there, obviously you know, it's not terrible talent I mean, they lost some of their best defenders in free agency, I think you could probably blame the front office for not really putting a focus on that, but, and also DeJounte Murray got hurt, and Lonnie Walker got hurt, and Derek Wise got hurt for a while but like, you know they still have enough talent to be more than 500 right now, and especially with the Rosen's hot start, I mean, to be 9 and 10. I mean, maybe focus on your own issues. Because the Spurs haven't been anything special since Kawhi has stopped playing for them, basically. Yeah, like two all-NBA players, you'd expect they'd be better than 9 and 10. And yeah. on, back on the leadership thing, I saw some stuff on Twitter, like Matt Moore and Zach Lowe were talking about uh, how leading by example usually isn't enough in the NBA, and Zach Lowe talked about how uh, when he did his Portland article about last week, Everyone was talking about how when Lillard came in, he was a lead by example guy, but they like pushed him to do more than that because they felt like he needed to do more. But like Lillard's a guy that loves to talk. Like Lillard literally has a rap album. Like you can't literally compare him to Kawhi. When Kawhi is like literally like one of the most quiet guys. Like besides Tim Duncan, probably the most quiet guy to come in the NBA in the last 20 years. Like, you can't exactly compare him to to Lillard's leadership style. So like I, I think Kawhi is the fine the way he is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, speaking about Kawhi as a player, I think um, you know he kind of had. A, he, I mean, to be honest, his baseline is very high. I think that's one of the things you notice about Kawhi is that he just doesn't have bad games. Like, And even if he does have a bad game, he's still giving you reasonable production in terms of rebounding. His shooting efficiency might be a little bit off, but for the most part, he's had really solid games, and he's been solid defensively on every game. But um, it really does feel like now that uh, he's put that little jam foot behind him, he's really hit a groove here. I mean, I thought that performance, um, that performance against the Heat was just really, really impressive, especially when... Dwayne Wade's been hot all game. He's been sort of torturing the Raptors. And then at the end of the game, Nick Nurse just says, well, we got Kawhi, we'll put him on Dwayne Wade, and all of a sudden Dwayne Wade can't score at all, and the Raptors win the game. Like, you know, I'll take yeah, that from a mute it was leader. Fun, man. Like, especially, did he have the guys that should be able to slow down a guy like Kawhi? Like, James Johnson, Justice Winslow are both, like, thick wings. Like, that should be able to, like, be yeah. with him athletically. And Kawhi was just dominating them. Like, he's starting to, like, really look to, like full strength. Yeah, for sure. And, um, I mean, it, it is interesting that you brought up the, the thick wings thing because, like, you know, Stanley Johnson's probably done the best job of anybody against Kawhi, which is a weird thing to say. And I thought Winslow kind of, you know, is the same type of player that uh, Johnson is. Although I thought Winslow also got away with some very obvious fouls throughout the game, and I was surprised that he finished the game with only three fouls. Uh, and it did prompt Kawhi to pick up his first uh, regular season tech in 422 appearances, which, again, I mean, that's just incredible that he, he maintained his composure for eight seasons to only pick up one tech ever. But uh, And a questionable tech at that. Like, even yeah. just in Nurse's comments, he was like, yeah, I just saw him saunter over there and say something, and, like, I was surprised he got one. Like, it's not like he was, like, egregiously yelling and clapping at him. He was just like, come on, I don't think that's the best foul. Yeah, exactly. Or something exactly. like that. Um. One thing I, I, I'm really liking out of Kawhi recently is the rebounding. Like, he's been a solid rebounder for his entire career. Um, the Spurs have sort of traditionally always played with two bigs, so there's not as many rebounds available for him to grab. But this year, especially when, um, you know, he's playing with Ibaka, and even sometimes when he's playing with JV, like, uh, the Raptors have had this issue of, of basically not being able to rebound long long shots, like long jumpers, three-point shots, stuff like that. And basically when Kawhi puts his mind to it, I mean, he's got, like, the wingspan of a center so and and he's obviously very athletic so i mean he's been great on the defensive glass is his playmaking is improving a little bit i feel like his teammates are getting a bit better chemistry with him especially kyle because kyle's been trying to throw him like this over the top pass for like the entire season and it always gets busted up and they finally finally connected for it uh in the game uh against the wizards yeah, I think he, uh, I'm checking now, he's got his highest rebound percentage of his career. That definitely has to do with uh, not playing in the traditional San Antonio style. But, like, even right now, he's got, um, 
the second, like you're talking about, he's getting better at his, his assist percentage right now is the second highest of his career. Mm -hmm. Like, like he's getting like he's gonna be he's gonna have an incredible season, man. Like he's like putting up pretty similar numbers to what he did in his MVP year, and he's like you can tell he's still not totally up to like form yet. So it's exciting to see like what he's gonna become as this as the year progresses. Um, he did face a little bit of criticism, and I guess well, not just him, but also sort of Nick Nurse, but. Um, about the fact that he was going uh, into isolation a lot in, in crunch time. Are you concerned about that, or do you see it more as a function of what Kawhi Leonard is as a player in terms of his skill set? A little bit is who he is, but I think a bit of it's kind of just ego management. Like, uh, Nurse is probably just trying to show him, like, you're our guy, trying to give him a lot of sets as it is. But, like, even as the year's gone on, they've kind of – it's wax and wane. Like, sometimes he goes lots of isolation. Sometimes they give it to him in the post more. And, like, the team's assist percentage has gone up as the season progressed, so, like, they're getting more comfortable together. I'd say, like – it's just they're still kind of feeling each other out. Once, like, Nurse becomes totally comfortable with how Kawhi is as a player, I'm sure he'll have a lot more intricate ways to get Kawhi going rather than just, you know, we'll give it to you on the right block and, like, maybe run one stagger on the other side. Yeah. Um, all right, moving on from Kawhi and this uh, strange drama, um, Kyle Lowry has basically continued his production. I mean, he is still leading the league at uh, 10 points, 4 assists per game. Again, this is pretty much a big shock considering that Kyle has never really been a high assist guy. His previous career high was 7.4 and he was playing a lot more minutes back then. Um, I mean, first off, what do you think is behind the playmaking? And second of all, do you feel like it's sustainable? Um, I think what's behind it is probably the absence of DeMar. Because, like, DeMar's a pretty, like, as much as uh, credit as De DeMar gets for his scoring, he's the highest assist guy, like, for a two-guard. Like, you see what he's doing yeah. in San Antonio now with a bigger role. And, like, Kawhi, that's just not who he is, really. Like, he's gotten better at it, but he's not a high assist guy. So, like, Lowry had a 34.7 assist percentage once before with the Raptors, and now it's up to about 41. So you'd think the removal of a guy like DeMar would make that possible. And they're also playing a little bit faster, so mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely sustainable. Like, a 5% increase with, like, an, like taking out arguably the most ball dominant guy in the league uh, and replacing him with a guy like Kawhi. And now they're also playing like Kyle a lot more with the bench and whatnot. Like it just kind of makes sense that his assist percentage will go up. Do I think it's sustainable? Maybe like high thirties, like forties is pretty, pretty tough for assist percentage, but I think it definitely is like right now he looks like, you know, prime Steve Nash with a better butt. <laughs> um, um, the one, I think the one thing with Kyle that may get scouted over time is um, how much he's passing to the rolling big man at a pick and roll. And, you know, uh, I think teams are already starting to kind of clue into the fact that Kyle always wants to pass when he comes off the high screen, and he's not really looking for his own shot at all, and they're going to sag back into the paint um, to do that. The one thing Kyle has done to combat that is, A, play faster. Um, he's, he's able to get the ball down the, fl the floor. I mean, against the Heat, for example, he got like four assists just by pushing the pace in transition, got easy dunks for guys like OG, Kawhi, um, Pascal got a layup. Um, so he's, he's doing a great job with that, and also he's – just really varying his looks like he's you know he's throwing bounce passes you know pocket passes he's throwing you know the lobs over the top to jv that are they there's only like a brief split second where jv is even open for that and kyle's basically leading all his big men to the basket with the pass but um it does feel like that part might become an a bit of more of an issue because if defenses close out the paint then kyle needs to score and i feel like at this point of his career kyle is not really a reliable scorer yeah, I'd agree with that. And he doesn't exactly have, like, the Mike Conley-esque floater game either. No. So, like, right, right now, like you said, he's definitely throwing guys open more than, like, they're kind of getting open, and he's, like, leading them into spots. So, like, if teams do kind of clamp in on him and try to make him beat them, it'll be kind of tough. Like, he's got – I think he's got the lowest usage right now of his entire career in Toronto. So, you'd like to see that go up a bit because, like, as much as Kyle is a cerebral passer and whatnot, you'd like to see him, like – like imposes will scoring wise a little bit more, but like I feel like right now he's kind of just trying to keep things loose and fun and like trying to make sure everyone's getting theirs to start the year. So I'm sure as the year goes on and then into the playoffs, he'll kind of you know become a bit more dominant with the ball. Yeah, for sure. Um, another guy that I wanted to touch on. That, I mean, this has been a very exciting season for the Raptors so far. They're 17 and four, best record in the league, no big deal. Um, Pascal Siakam. Um, he. Like, the fact that he's actually scoring a lot more has not actually come at the expense of the Raptors' offense in any way because his usage rate is still absurdly low for someone who's... Yeah, sixth, um, low, sixth highest in the team. Yeah, right? I mean, like, he's, he's almost averaging 15 points a game. It's just that he's so incredibly efficient. He is currently, and he has been this way for about a month, the NBA leader in two-point percentage. And even his three-point percentage is coming up, by the way. He's hit 9 of 18 over his last uh, two weeks from deep, but... Um, I mean, what's the ceiling with Pascal? Like, should he have more of the ball? Like, should more of the offense run through Pascal? 
Uh, I think with the roster is currently constructed, I think his like I don't think he should have the ball too much more. Like I've been I've been pretty hard on the Pascal bandwagon for a while. My first article at RR was a uh, 2,500 word love letter about Pascal. Okay. And, like you, you look at the last uh, 15 games, I think Woodley had these stats on Twitter. He's averaging 17 points, 7.2 rebounds, 2.3 assists, 1.5 steals on 69% true shooting, and he's got a plus uh, 14.5 on core net rating. And then on synergy, he's in the 99th percentile for offensive efficiency. So like he's obviously primed for a little bit of regression. That's like pretty absurd. But I think I think you're the one that thrown out that's been thrown out the Marion comparison. I think he can definitely be that type of player for this era. Like he could be a Draymond Marion type of like role player star for this era and become like I don't know like third team All NBA and then like an All Defensive Team type of guy where like his impact on both ends is like so undeniable. Like I think right now he. The role he's in is kind of perfect for the team that he's on, especially as he kind of like you can tell he kind of trips over his feet occasionally still, like he did used to in his first year. But he's getting so much more comfortable. Like maybe next year if Kawhi does leave, we could see like a huge jump from him in a way and like get his usage up pretty high. But I think he's perfectly suited for what he's doing right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and look, the Raptors have always needed that in between offense guy. Like there was such a drop off in previous years of like Colin Demar could score, JV could score in you know in the post and in pick and roll but um maybe his defensive shortcomings will limit his minutes um and so there was just never really a consistent third guy in terms of scoring and now they finally have that like pascal is that guy like he will and the thing is like the part that's sustainable for pascal not necessarily is like the spin moves and all the post moves and stuff like that because like he is taking a lot of tough shots he and he's just got tremendous touch and he's you know he's getting a lot of shots to drop i feel like it just to the eye looks a little bit unsustainable for him to do that consistently and hit like 70% of his, you know, turnaround hook shots and stuff like that. But um, the part that is sustainable is like how many hustle baskets he gets per game, just off cuts running in transition. Um, you know, when the Raptors get him a mismatch, he's so crafty in the post now that I'm actually not too concerned, um, you know, about basically just giving the offense to him. And I think, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting in terms of the way the Raptors offense is constructed, right? Cause Kyle's obviously, you know, dominating with the pass, but for the most part, Kyle's going to get most of his points through the three-point shot. Kawhi's going to work in the mid-range. And then you got Pascal, who's like a guy who fills in all the little gaps, but also is just a tenacious scorer at the basket. And you pair him with, like, JV. You pair him with, like, Serge. I mean, he plays well with both those guys. Like, he's basically the perfect, perfect third banana the Raptors have always needed. And plus, he defends big wings, which has always been a weakness for the Raptors. Like, it's it's incredible how much Pascal has developed. And um, in terms of the Sean Marion comp, I think right now, functionally, he's more like uh, the way Thad Young used to be like That's when a good he one. was younger. Um, I think Sean Marion would be like more of the ceiling. But I also thought, like, honestly, Sean Marion was never as skilled offensively as he thought he was. And so I always thought he took some bad shots, whereas, like, I don't really think Pascal takes bad shots. Yeah, Pascal seems to be like honestly, he's like if you watch the most recent episode of Open Gym, he's literally still the most humble guy. And I'm at like he won the Eastern Conference Player of the Week and didn't even really care. So I think he's going to be totally fine with just like sitting at this low usage role. Like I don't think he's going to be you know like laboring for more shots in any way. So, do you feel like uh, in the playoffs, like there might be more of an issue when the game slows down and it's more of a half court game? Do you feel like you know maybe then when the the lack of three point shooting. Um, can hurt the Raptors and maybe because there is a thought that like OG might fit the starting unit better just based on the fact that he's a little bit more low usage and he shoots more threes yeah I'd agree with that I think me and you talked about that last time I was on about how like uh OG probably fits a little better with the starters so I think like Pascal will still be quite effective in the playoffs even with like the slower pace I just think it would have to he would be more effective in different lineups like I don't think he would fit as well with the starters as he would normally like mm-hmm. you put him with the second unit and let him run transition and lead the break with like Fred spacing instead or something like that. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. And I think, look, Nick Nurse is really shown to be experimental, and I think he has, especially with some of the injuries the Raptors have had with the bench, he has staggered in more minutes with Kawhi with the bench, Pascal running with the bench. And I think especially when Pascal runs with the bench, it just helps everyone. And really the guy that helps the most is Fred, because Fred really needs somebody to help create some open spot-up looks for him, because he's a really good casual shoot shooter. Mm. Fred, he's just not very good creating his own offense and you know the Raptors have run into trouble um throughout the year you know off the bench with that I mean uh do you feel like the bench is quietly improving now that everyone's starting to get back to health I mean basically it's just Norm who's out right now um but you're seeing a little bit better um you know you're seeing better shooting lines from Fred you're seeing 
DeLon, you know, hit some threes. Although DeLon is just wildly inconsistent every game. It's, it is what it is. He's the new turns for us. Um, and, you know, like, I don't know. Even CJ starting to hit some threes. Like, do you feel like the bench is coming around, or do you see more structural issues with the bench? Yeah, they're definitely starting to come around because, like, they're just not – they just weren't making shots to start the year. Like, CJ is still shooting, like, 26%, and, like, no one's really above, like, 33 besides DeLon, but that's, like, low volume and stuff like that. So, like, they were getting – like, I know defensively they've been getting killed, but a lot of that's just, like, when you take – because the bench unit always takes so many threes, but they're giving up so many long rebounds. Teams are getting in transition easier. Like, uh, the main thing is just, uh, like, now that DeLon's back, Fred doesn't have to create near as much. He seems, like, way more comfortable. He can kind of, like – do a little bit of your turn, my turn, going off pick and rolls with Delon. Whereas, like, to start the year when it was him and Norm, Norm would get so out of control, Fred would feel like he had to take the ball for, like, five straight possessions just to calm everything <laughs> down. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I think things are definitely starting to improve. I'd say give it, like, ten more games before we make any sweeping judgments. And if things are still kind of rough then, maybe you could consider moving Pascal back to the bench. Yeah. Um, by the way, I wouldn't really put Pascal on the bench in any sort of context right now just because he's playing so well. Like, you yeah, would just sort of, like, mm, sort of subtly spoon more of his minutes towards the bench unit as compared to the starting unit. Because, like, man, when a player takes this big of a leap and he's already holding down the starting spot and the Raptors are winning, like, I wouldn't really move him to the bench and sort of discourage him in any way. Even though I'm, I'm sure he would take that well and he loves playing with the bench. But I just think that, like, you know, he fully deserves basically to get his name called every night. Um, mm-hmm. And in terms of the bench, then, I, I think um, one thing – the one thing I think the bench might need a bit of an adjustment in terms of just, like, I agree with you defensively that, like, a lot of it is coming off bad offense leading to, like, really easy shots for the opposition, and that's how they're giving up these, like, huge runs is you take bad shots and then you give up transition buckets, like, you know. Um, but do you feel like part of that is also just, like, they miss having such a solid back line of defense with Pascal and Pirtle where – not only were they able to defend at half court, but they were able to generate so many deflections through blocks and steals and, you know, you know whatnot, and, and basically being so reliable at the rim that the guards can play up higher and be more aggressive. That because I felt like last year the Raptors bench unit you know, was always playing in transition, uh, and this year they're always just defending in transition. Yeah, that's a good point. Like last year, I'm pretty sure they didn't actually like people used to say they played so fast, but I think they played at a, a slower pace than the starters. They just scored so many live ball turnovers, they got so many easy buckets. It seemed like they were always playing in transition. Mm-hmm. Whereas like this year, their activity level is so much lower with like JV and Ibaka, like because you know those guys always drop like back. Whereas like Pascal was way more active in the pick and roll and like Pirtle was Pirtle like, came to the perimeter a couple times. Yeah, he was like one of the most like mobile guys, like like low key one of the most low, mobile bigs in the league. Whereas, like, I'm pretty sure right now, like, the one of the bench lamps with Ibaka is giving up, like, a defensive rating of, like, 140 or something like that. Yeah, it's ugly. And, uh, yeah, like, they just, yeah, that's a good point. Like, they just don't have, like, the activity level that they used to. But, like, I definitely think it is a confluence of, like, the, the long rebounds and, like, the lack of youth in the bench and whatnot. So, yeah, good point. Yeah. Uh, by the way, sidebar on the, the Pirtle thing, I'm a little bit surprised that he's not getting more time in San Antonio. Yeah, that's surprising me too. Like, wh- like, who is so good in San Antonio that like should play over Pirtle right now? Pirtle, um, he's averaging four points a game in 11 minutes a game, and he's not even playing every single contest. There's games, entire games where he sat out. Like, I mean, I don't want to question Greg Popovich twice in the Ooh. podcast, but like, I think you could get a lot more out of Pirtle than what you're currently getting. I mean. I would not yeah. play him over. I would not play Pau Gasol over Proto at this point. I'm, I'm, I know Pau is probably a little bit better offensively, but um, I mean Proto is just miles better defensively. Especially where he's like a big piece you got back in the Kawhi trade to just kind of bury him. Like you think they'd want to like make it seem like, oh yeah, we we did our own, we did pretty well with that. Like, mm-hmm. Yo, I'm, I'm look, man. <laughs> There's a lot of there's a lot of there's like a cult that goes around with the Spurs, and I, deservedly so, man. I mean, like obviously when you've been that successful, you. You've had like 50 win seasons nonstop for like 20 years, and you won a couple of championships. Like, of course, there should be, you know, the utmost respect given to that organization based on how they have won, despite uh, you know playing in a small market. But like, man, every time like a player goes to Spurs, it's like, oh, they're gonna magically you know transform into this and that. I'm like, the people are like, oh, you know, DeRozan's gonna play defense. You know, DeRozan's gonna be able to shoot threes because he's gonna go with Chip Anglin. And, like, Jakob Proto's really going to develop and be a full-time starter. And it's like, n- first off, none of those things have happened. DeMar's shooting 20% from three. He's playing less defense than ever. Um, and Proto can't even get in the rotation. Like, you know, there's just there's just a cult that, that sort of follows the Spurs. And uh, 
So I mean, I don't know. Obviously, I'm biased because Kawhi's on the team right now, but I could definitely see where Kawhi would feel like he's getting squeezed. Um, yeah, by this sort of institution that everyone respects. Anyway, um, going back to the Raptors, uh, what have you thought about Nick Nurse so far? I mean, we've seen about 20 games. Sort of, where has he succeeded and where has he maybe failed? I feel like failure is probably too hard for him. I don't think he's really ultimately failed anything yet, but. Maybe just, like, small annoyances you've had with the coach. Yeah, I'd say mine are probably pretty on par with basically everyone else's, where, like, the a bit too much Kawhi isolation. But, like, as we talked about earlier, that that will probably come down as the year progresses. Like, the assist percentage for the team's gone up. They're, uh, like, they seem to, like, not be happening as often as they used to. And, like, that might just be ego management of him trying to, like, endear himself to Kawhi. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to we're gonna play through you and stuff like that. Another thing was also, like, have you ever heard uh, on Dunked On they call Steve Kerr Kumbaya Kerr because he plays too many guys all the time? There's a little bit of that, like a little bit too Lorenzo, too much Lorenzo Brown and Malachi Richardson for my liking sometimes. Like obviously part of that's got to do with injuries, but like you don't have to get so liberal with playing Malachi 12 minutes sometimes. Maybe just cut it to like four or something like that. And wow. then, uh, but other than that, he's been spectacular, man. Like he's got a rotating starting lineup with one of the best teams in the league, and there's no problems with ego. Like he seems to yeah. be able, like he's got real good control of the locker room. He's JV's having his most productive year, but coming off the bench. Uh, like, besides the bench playing, like, pretty, you know, a bunch of guys are having down years, which is basically just due to shooting. Everyone else is having their best year in, like, quite a long time. He's, like, saved Serge Ibaka. And, oh uh, like, yeah. like Ibaka, Ibaka might get, like, all-star votes. And, like, this summer we thought he could, like, possibly be, like, dead money. We were looking at him like he was Ennis Cantor. So, like, I don't think he can be mad at Nurse. Like, third and O rating, seventh and D rating, second best net rating in the league. There's five players with PERs above 20. Like, I don't think he can, like, have too many gripes with Nurse besides, like, the Kumbaya stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, even that, like, it, it's just weird because, like, you can't have it both ways. The Raptors have injuries, and you want to keep Kawhi and his minutes lower. You want to keep Kyle's minutes lower, and maybe that's one of the other things with Nurse is that he has sort of shown uh, a sort of a conservative approach where if the team, if the opposing team makes a bit of a run, he is very quick to go back to his starters, mm -hmm. um, and the starters have played heavy minutes because of that, and also because the bench has just been, you know, largely trash for most of the year, although it's getting better. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you can't have it both ways. Like if you have a short roster, um, because of injuries and you also want to keep your starters minutes low, then you have to play some guys like Lorenzo and, and even Malachi. And, um, you know, it is what it is. I, it's, I, I do hate all the, <laughs> all the hating on Lorenzo Brown really does get me down. Cause I'm just like, man, he's a fourth string point guard. Like wh what fourth string point guard are you bringing in? That's going to be you know, more competent than Lorenzo Brown. At least Lorenzo's had some, like, nice moments defensively. I think in that, like, Dallas game when he picked, like, J.J. Bray and stuff like that. Like, man, fourth-string point guards don't make plays. Like, if you look mm -hmm. around the league, it's like, I don't even know. They're all they're all basically pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Would you rather Shaq Harrison or Lorenzo Brown? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> see, like, that's I, – I didn't even know that that man existed. So, there you go. <laughs> um, but, um, one other thing uh, with uh, – the Raptors right now. It's just like, you know, we're coming up sort of through the quarter of the season. We've sort of seen where the Raptors strengths and weaknesses are. Um, let's say the bench doesn't really fully rebound from this sort of slow start. And it, it basically is an issue all season. Um, could the Raptors make uh, a move where you change the roster and bring in a guy um, that can help the bench? Cause it feels like the bench does have a bit of an issue right now with just shot creation. Uh, and not even just shot creation, but shot making. Like, they need a shot maker off the bench a little bit. And, um, you know, those are always the guys that are available during the trade deadline. Is If you want to bring a guy off the bench and be your sixth man, um, those guys are usually available. And I don't know, would, would you look into a deal like that? And did you have any players that you think would fit basically that need? Well, right now the roster is fairly complete, like, you know, Definitely more than the, the other elite teams in the league because the Raptors always use their draft picks like pretty. Uh, they spread them out. They don't use them all on shady centers like the Warriors or like waste them on Gershon Yabusele. But uh, other than that, like the only spot that could really use like a cup like a little bit of fortifying is maybe like a, a wing defender to guard three fours. Like say, okay. like not this is a, a problem for the Raptors every year. Which yeah. the, this year is like not really a problem. We're really nitpicking, obviously, but. Yeah, I spent a bit more time looking at bio candidates because I feel like um, like making a trade probably isn't in the the cards. But like, say Anthony Tolliver becomes available because okay. he's like pl not playing at all now that Dario Sarge is there. Yeah. Trevor, then maybe he gets bought up by the Suns and the uh, the Rockets like don't want to pay him or something like that. Wesley Matthews might become available, something like that. And then um, 
say DeLon still struggles a little while from now. I know yeah. you're, you're going to like this one. Maybe they flip him for Jeremy Lin, because I know that's probably the yeah. goal of the Hawks anyways, is try to, to try and trade him for someone a bit younger. So, like, DeLon's 26. He fits a little bit better with their timeline. Jeremy Lin's playing incredible right now, so he could come in and provide a little bit. But I'd honestly rather have DeLon. I think he's going to snap out of it. But let's just say he stays like that. And my heart wants them to try and pull a trade for T. Ross, but he's completely redundant with C.J. Miles. Okay, so no <laughs> wait, hold on. You can't, how, how many people love T. Ross like this? Because we know what Terrence Ross is, man. He's really, I don't know. I just, I don't like unreliable players. Like, it just bothers <laughs> me. Because, like, you just hate expecting things and then not having it happen. Like, that's almost worse than a guy like P.J. Tucker where you're like, I'm not expecting you to score. Just do your thing. And obviously PJ is a better player than, than T Ross, but I mean, what, what's your love for T Ross? Where is that coming from? I don't know. I just like his game. My my game myself, I'm like an undersized two guard that just kind of chucks. So okay. I can't help but love a guy like T Ross that just like has no fear of taking an early sh- a twenty second twenty seconds left in the shot clock three from like four feet be- behind the line. Mm. I've got a lot of love for a guy like that. Wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't feel like those are very good players. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think. Yeah, like you mentioned, man. I mean, the Raptors are pretty complete. If they do add a guy, I think they will try to do it through the buyout market, stuff like that. And, um, you know, they have players that you can cut. I mean, everyone already hates Lorenzo now, so you can probably cut him. <laughs> or even Malachi. Um, although I think Malachi is a slightly better contract. But, I mean, like, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be a major addition. Like, I, I sort of, I uh, tossed around the idea of trading for Bradley Beal, and, like, I don't fully support it. I mean, like, I think it's like a good deal in terms of value. Like you always want to, um, if possible, consolidate sort of smaller chips into one bigger chip because you know ultimately you only play five players at a time. So depth is ultimately in the end like a little bit limited, right? You would rather have five really good players than ten average players. Um, but even a guy like Beal, like I don't really feel like that is necessarily the best fit for the Raptors either. Even though I think he would fit the Raptors really nicely, especially if he played more minutes with the bench. But I don't think you're trading for Bradley Beal, who's 25 and coming up and then putting him on the bench either. You know? Um, so it's probably going to be not that sexy, but it's probably going to be like a the Raptors buy, you know, Luke Richard and buy Mute <laughs> after he gets bought out by the Clippers for some reason. Or maybe they trade for him. I don't know. But That's a really good one, actually. Yeah, that's that's kind of what they need, basically. Like, if they had two OGs off the bench, instead of having to play CJ, yeah. <laughs> it'd be great. Because CJ, bro, CJ's just not, CJ's just not cutting it, man. And, uh, yeah. All right, let's let's um, let's look ahead to this upcoming week. The Raptors have three intriguing games. The first game against the Grizzlies in Memphis. The Raptors have traditionally played Memphis really well, um, you know, even dating back to when Memphis was really at the peak of their grit and grind years. Uh, the Raptors have basically been able to, you know, grit and grind right up there with them. But uh, the Grizzlies are pretty good this year, surprisingly so, and uh, it won't be a walk in the park. What, what do you think about that game? Uh, I think the Raptors match up pretty well. Like, you know, the Grizzlies, they're a trap game for a lot of teams that play fast-paced because the Grizzlies play like, you know, like they play like it's 2005 and slow you down and all that, whereas, like, the Raptors honestly play so much half-court where they just give the ball to Kawhi or run Kyle pick and roll, so... I think they should be totally fine to play, like, a game at the Grizzlies' pace. Like, they have a much better offense than, like, a Conley Gasol pick and roll when they're both, like, 32. So I think the Raptors will get that one pretty easily. Um, who do you see as Memphis's solution to Kawhi Leonard? Is it Kyle Anderson or Garrett Temple or maybe even the surprise rookie, Jaron Jackson, who is, like, barely 19 years old but actually still pretty good? Like, he's the I'll, third best player on that team I'll already. Dylan Brooks, but he's hurt. Just because he's, but I want to say him because he's the hometown kid. I don't know, maybe Wayne Selden. He's a bit thicker, but Wayne Selden. Like, I think that their best bet's Garrett Temple, or actually no, probably Kyle Anderson because he'll know some tricks from playing against him in practice. But still, like Kawhi's gonna have a field day. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, this looks like a game where if you want to slow down, play half court, the Raptors will play through Kawhi and you know yeah. Pascal, and meanwhile the, the Grizzlies will play through Gasol and Conley, and as much as those guys are pretty good players, like. Uh, Kawhi's just a bit better. Kawhi's, that's one thing that's like so nice having Kawhi. It's just like you go into every game knowing you have the best player. So mm-hmm. you're just like, oh, I'm scared of this, this, and this. And then you're like, but we have Kawhi. So mm-hmm. he should be able to deliver. Obviously, no back-to-back in this scenario. So Kawhi is going to play. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I would comfortably call that a win, but I don't think it's going to be double digits. I think it's going to be like a eight-point win. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, next game, then, the Raptors are going to play the Golden State Warriors at uh, the Scotiabank Arena on Thursday. It's a uh, very highly anticipated game. It's probably the marquee game of the week. I've sort of perused through the schedule, and we really don't see anything better than uh, Raptors-Warriors. It's going to have the atmosphere and the hype of a sort of a finals type of you know, potential finals type matchup where you really want to see how the Raptors match up against the Warriors because they only play twice a year, obviously. Um, and honestly, the Raptors in the past, in the last couple of years here, have played some very, very good games against the Warriors. I mean, that 2016 game immediately comes to mind where Kyle had 41, and I think Steph had 44, and the Warriors all, always win these games, but, you know, it's just a lot of long, like, huge comebacks, and it's always very exciting, and um, there's always a lot of hype, so I don't really see it being different in this one. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a like, pretty exciting one. You know, the return of Alfonso McKinney, can't ask for much more than that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm happy for if, Alfonso. If man. Steph's back, if, because, like, there's rumors that he might be back for that game, I could see him trying to, like, win the MVP, like, get to first place in the MVP conversation that night, because, like, the Warriors have been so bad without him. If he comes yeah. back and scores, like, 45, like he did that one time in, like, 2015-16, mm-hmm. it could kind of just jolt him back to the top of the, like, MVP power rankings. But if he's not back, I think the the Raptors will, are probably the better team, honestly. So it's yeah, gonna yeah. be it's gonna be a good game. Oh yeah, for sure. Look, without Steph, the Raptors are better than the Warriors. I mean, we've seen how much the Warriors have struggled. Um, you know, obviously a fully healthy Warriors team is better than the Raptors, but you know, in the current state, I mean, I don't think KD and Clay have really adjusted well to sort of inheriting the team. Um, you know, in the absence of Steph, obviously Steph is the system. By the way, Steph is having such a good year. It's not fair, man. I mean, like, you look at Kemba Walker, you know, you're like, wow, he's scoring 60 points, and then he scored 43 the next day. And you look at his numbers, he's averaging, like, 29 points a game, and he's shooting 10 threes a game, shooting 40%. Like, Steph's like, yeah, that's cool. Like, I'm shooting, I'm also averaging 29 points a game. I'm shooting 50% from the field, 49% from three, um, 92% from the free throw line. Like, Steph is unfair, man. Like, yeah. ge- truly a generationally great player. Like, when he finishes his career, he could be top 10. Yeah, without a doubt. One of the things, like, with with all the rumors of Durant possibly leaving, like, I really want Durant to leave so we can see Steph oh, go back man. to having, like, a first year his team so that way we can ride out the rest of Steph's prime with him trying to put up, like, 34 on, like, 47% shooting and, like, 16 threes a game. Like, I want to see some, I want to see some, like, late career Steph that, like, he has his own team and he gets to do whatever he wants. Yeah, 2016 Steph Curry was pretty much the most entertaining season I've seen out of any player um, watching since like probably like Steve Nash during like the first two seven seconds or less seasons like that was like holy shit what is he doing and this is kind of the same thing like stuff was revolutionizing the game mm-hmm. yeah also winning 73 games that just gets yeah. overlooked the fact that the Warriors won 73 games and then Steph hit like 403 threes throughout the season like that's so that, many that's, threes that's man absurd part no one else has even gotten close to 300 and he topped 400 yeah he he wasn't like, oh, I'm going to try and get to, like, 300, 325 this year. He was like, no, I want <laughs> I want 400. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, the Raptors wrap up the week playing the Cleveland Cavaliers. Wow, playing both the Warriors. Sorry, both the finalists, um, you know, participants from last year. But, obviously, Ca- Cleveland is actually, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're plucky, but um, they've shown some fight, I would say. Obviously, Kevin Love is still out. He's going to be out for a while, but... Chetty Osman has really picked it up of late, and Colin Sexton has really picked it up of late. I mean, he just like shot 14 of 21 against uh, the Rockets mm-hmm. and, and beat the Rockets. But uh, I don't know. This this is a win. I don't know what else to say, really. Yeah, I kind of want to say the Cavs are on the East again because they've won two games. Wow. But uh, I don't know. I feel like the Raptors honestly won't lose a game to the Cavs again until the Cavs draft LeBron Jr. Like I feel like there's just gonna be too much mm-hmm. of like an X on the calendar every time they play the Cavs that they'll want to like take them out. So. Yeah, this is a win. Yeah, this this is like what the Bulls used to be. It was like once the Bulls got became trash, the Raptors were just like, forget, we're never losing the Bulls ever again. <laughs> we're just gonna crush you every single time. Um, yeah, I hope that's the case here. Mm. The Cavs suck. Yeah, that's a really pathetic. <laughs> Yo, and also like, what were the Cavs veterans doing? Like leaking like, oh, Colin Sexton doesn't listen to the veterans. Like George Hill tried to mentor him, he just looked him off. It's like. Why are you saying that to the media? Like he's just he's like 19 year old. He just started his NBA career. Like he's probably a little bit shy to be around this professionalized team. And like yeah. realistically, man, who's trying to learn from George Hill? <laughs> <laughs> he's talking about George Hill as if like, oh man, we have Steve Nash in the, in the team and he's not listening to him. He's like, okay, cool, I might actually listen to that. But 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. shout out Sexton. He's really turned the season around. It's, Especially uh, considering George Hill has, like, so little in common with Colin Sexton. Colin Sexton has, like, such, like, yeah. an up and down. Like, They're totally opposite in terms like, of players. Totally polar opposites. Like, what's he going to learn, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I mean, George Hill finessed the bag, though. He got the full oh, bag yeah. for not a very good career, ultimately, I would say. <laughs> I mean, there was talks that he might get, like, the max from Utah during that one random season. And then he, and he got uh, hurt all the time. He got hurt, yeah. He, like, missed, like, half a year with a toe injury. That's, that's kind of wild. Um, but, uh, yeah, okay, that does it for the podcast, really. Colin, thanks for coming on the show. Where can people find you and your work? Uh, on Twitter, at Colin Connors 4. I write for RR, and then I also write for uh, The Dream Shake, so I put all my work on there. So, you know, uh, yeah. So, okay, so you write for The Dream Shake. Uh, like, do you watch, like, most Rockets games? Uh, when I can. Like, okay. I've, I've got my own season going on, and I'm also in school, so I, I'm, like, I, don't know, I try to catch up on them when I can, and then I watch every live one I can. So I say I, I watch like half of them probably. Okay. Do you feel like the Rockets are fixed, by the way, or do you feel like because like they still had some like concerning losses along the stretch here, like losing to like I think they lost to Detroit as well. Yeah, I wouldn't say fixed, but they're like seventy five percent of the way there. Okay. I think Melo helped a lot. <laughs> Melo, yeah, Melo was just bad, man. Like and like, I feel bad for Melo because like I think individually as a player he could do better, but like. When teams are specifically scheming their entire offense to attack you on defense, like even if Melo's not on the ball, they'll like try to make them switch off the ball so Melo's helping on the rim and then Melo can't do anything at the rim. Like I just feel bad for him, man. Like mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the big thing is getting Eric Gordon back. Eric Gordon's like low key Yo. been probably the worst uh offensive like he's, the worst he's like top so three offensive threat in the league this year. He's shooting like twenty four percent from three and like thirty one percent from the field or something. Like yeah. once he gets back to normal, like that'll help the team a lot. I feel like yeah, he he like one of his signature moves is basically a like little right-handed floater that he does because he is a pretty good driver, mm-hmm. um, and he can't really dunk on people anymore, so he needs that floater. And like, I feel like he's hit like maybe two floaters all year. His, his yeah. finishing is just trash. He's actually doubled his shots from floater range this year, and he's not he's and his percentage is like plummeted. I don't know what he's doing, but hopefully he can figure out a way to get all the way to the rim again. I think part of it has to do with uh, they don't have near as many shooters, so the lane's a lot more clogged. But mm. they'll figure it out. Yeah, they'll figure it out. Once they get Ariza back, that'd be hilarious. Actually, if they just basically dump Melo and then get Ariza for the minimum, like that would be pretty good business by Daryl Morey. And they're probably going to get him back. Like, there's a lot of talk into like Houston Twitter and like from like reporters and stuff that like there's a there's strong interest both sides if he gets bought out to get him back. I don't think they'll give up anything for him, but I think if he hits the bio market, he, he's going to pick Houston. Yeah. Wow. I mean, like, should I, there I, be a role I, against I, that? I, like, you should right? you should not be able to go back to that team immediately. That's like. I don't know. It, it's just kind of sketchy to me, but I would prefer if he goes to Houston as compared to like somewhere like, you know, Philadelphia, for example, because Philly yeah, is also fair. a bit scary. And that's why he's playing so bad in Phoenix because he wants to go back to Houston. So. And yet they're playing him like 40 minutes a game. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they're really trying to get the full 50 million out of him. Anyway, <laughs> uh, read Connor's work, uh, follow him on Twitter, and uh, you know, good luck on your exams, man. Yeah, thanks. Talk to you soon.